So first, uh, thank you to the organizers for this uh, great opportunity. And as uh, introduced, I will tell you about uh, those two, a little bit of those two aspects of uh, QCD uh, amplitudes. And so I will start with some overview of the sort of motivation I'm coming from. Um, and then I will talk, uh, tell you a bit those two aspects, which the constraining of the of the analytic structure will be related to the problem of finding a finite basis of uh, Feynman integrals in a little bit different sense than than David was mentioning. And uh, secondly, in exploiting this this analytic structure, we will see that it has a relation to dispersion relations, and in the approach I called uh, integrated unitarity. And then I will conclude with some uh, future perspectives. Okay, so let me start with some motivation. So um, I'm interested in providing scattering amplitudes for precision phenomenology at the LHC uh, collider. So at some point to to uh, provide theoretical predictions for the uh, for the observables there, you need sooner or later scattering amplitudes in either QCD or the full standard model, also the electroweak sector. Um, and we will specifically look at the analytic properties of these amplitudes. So we will try we will try to constrain them uh, via the notion of uh, uh, finite basis beyond one loop and uh, exploit this analytic structure. So we assume that we know it and how can we actually use it in, in practice. So uh, just a little bit of an overview of what's uh, possible these days in, in QCD. Um, so I mean uh, massless uh, internal QCD. So you, you can have some external uh, massive legs. So at five loops, the two point beta function is available. At, at four loops, it's, it's a three point function. At three loops, it's, uh, it's a massless, uh, either fully massless kinematics, which I also work on. And uh, these days, there is also an, a, a work towards including one off shell uh, particle uh, in the external state. Um, and at, uh, at two loops, there are uh, a lot of efforts to. Um, to compute uh, five-point amplitudes with multiple uh, scales inside. Uh, and at one loop, more or less, everything is understood algorithmically. There are packages, you can press a button, you get, get a numerical answer for your, for your amplitude. Okay, so uh, as a background for the amplitude, at some point you need uh, Feynman integrals. And again, for QCD, um, we need dimensionally regulated Feynman integrals, so all of those one over epsilon poles we need to have under control. And we'll focus on this, this Feynman integral structure because it will be the most interesting for the, for the, uh, for the analytic properties of the, of the amplitude. Uh, and uh, the, the results which are available now for the Feynman integrals but not yet promoted to scattering amplitudes uh, are uh, again some non planar results in, in free loop uh, four point uh, with one mass and then uh, a lot of studies on uh, five point with uh, multiple uh, masses at two loops and also the the six point as as uh, yang zhang will 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 tell you later and also the the new result on the four loop uh, planar massless ladder which i will uh, talk about here in this in this approach so let's start with uh, trying to constrain the structure of Feynman integrals so this will be the the work uh, based on my my collaboration with tong ji yang so um it is well known that at one loop, the most complicated integral that you that you have to compute, um, uh, in even in dimensional regularization, is a pentagon, and also all of its subsectors, so a box, triangle, bubble, and, and a tadpole. And of course, up to all the permutations or the values of off-shell, on-shell legs, internal, external. But there is an upper bound of how complicated your 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 integral can be, and we're trying to ask here, what happens at higher loops? Is it a coincidence at one loop or is it just a, just a usual property in dimensional regularization? So this problem, this question has been uh, um, um, researched on by various collaboration, including uh, David. So um, um, in, 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 this, in his paper, he shown that in a planar massless case, you only need 11 denominators 
at, at two loops, even in dimensional regularization, so we'll never need to com com compute any more complicated uh, integral. And then, of course, if you want to decompose an integral, you also need to consider all of its subsectors. So it's a little bit more complicated than at one loop. Um, but the point is that when you when you go to higher loops and you start adding more and more external legs to your to your integral. You don't go forever in terms of how complex your, your function can be. You, you stop at some point, so 11 denominators is the bounded two loops. Uh, and this, we will show here that this proceeds at any loop order in dimensional regularization, and we will try to study more carefully the, the two loop um, example. So um, how do we see that it's 11 denominators and not some, some other number. It's a very simple accounting. Um, so the number of independent denominators or generalized propagators that you can write down for your integral is uh, the same as the number of independent scalar products that, that you can create, which involve your loop momenta. So you have two loop momenta, let's say two loops. So there are three scalar products that you can create involving those two. And then you have all the external momenta. And in traditional so-called conventional dimensional regularization, you treat all the external momenta as independent, d-dimensional, and then you can create, well, n minus one external legs times two uh, scalar products with them. However, there is another uh, scheme in dimensional regularization called the toothed Weltman scheme. And in this scheme, you only treat your external momenta purely in four dimensions, no, no epsilon, no, no d-dimensions. And uh, Tuff and Weltman shown that you get basically the same physical results for amplitudes or any observables uh, using both of those approaches. So of course, it's beneficial to just constrain your, your external data to just live in explicitly four dimensions. So um, in four dimensions, again, you have uh, only four, four momenta which are independent. Uh, so starting from five point, all of your uh, external uh, uh, kinematics it can be projected to a to an external basis, and this is uh, this is the property that we will heavily rely on. So uh, starting from uh, uh, higher than uh, two loop five point, you will not generate any new uh, scalar products, and therefore no new generalized propagators. So um, you see that there is not enough denominators at two loop five point to actually span the whole um, the, the whole topology. So you introduce those irreducible scalar products, which will appear in the numerator of your integral. And um, no matter uh, how many how many legs you you add uh, starting from two loop five point, you can only have eleven of those of those generous propagators. And actually if you go to two loop eight point, this this happens to be a the kinematics with all the, let's assume all the uh, triple vertices for, for a second. This is the first kinematics where you can actually span the whole generalized propagator basis in your denominators. So actually, if you start putting more legs at two loop eight point, so nine point, ten point, so on, you will have a set of denominators which is in. Uh, itself linearly dependent. So what you can do in order to simplify this, you partial fraction. Okay, so this partial fractioning can be done explicitly. And uh, if you if you try to list all of your um, uh, options, how to attach eight or, or well, those pinched quadruple vertices, so 10 and nine legs to, to a two loop vacuum diagram, you will quickly arrive at those 12 pictures. And actually, you can show that every other picture that you that you draw can be uh, sooner or later reduced either to those twelve or their subsectors. So all the pinched version or the two loop three point, two loop four point, and so on. Okay, so the the first column has been found by by David and collaborators. So it's a it's a is the planar topology. So again, the first one is only triple vertices, so it's eight point, and then we can also add. Uh, additional legs to the to the to the uh, three point uh, vertex, the internal vertex, 
because then we don't change the denominator structure. So we have to consider those uh, independently. So we have three of those options. And then we also have the, the free non-planar contribution in the first uh, line and their versions of the of the uh, pinched nine point and, and ten point integrals. Okay, so we have this uh, this set of topologies. We'll refer to them as finite basis topologies. And uh, at Tulips, we claim this is all you you have to know. Um, and we also study in the in the paper in more more details different dimensions, dif different loops. So uh, in lower dimensions, of course, you, you will have lower number of the independent denominators. So you will have a seven uh, denominator topologies, which are basically a four point uh, or with some pinching up to six point structures. Uh, in, in DIMREC in two dimensions. Now at higher loops, um, you can also derive explicitly the, this number of how many independent denominators you need. It's very simple counting. And it, it turns out that at three loops, it's a, it's a 12 point denominator structure and four loops is 17 point. Okay, so it's not very easy these days, but at two loops, we are almost there, as I, as I said. Five point is, is heavily researched, six point is, is also um, researched these days. Okay, so as I said, we have this reduction to, uh, to uh, those 12 diagrams and all of their subtopology. So the reduction comes from just partial fractioning. You can do this automatically, just, just load the package in Mathematica, it's called a part, then just, just, uh, just do it algorithmically. If you're interested in a compact formula for the reduction, we also provide it. And again, it's just a very long expression for saying that it's a partial fraction version of the, of the reduction. Um, okay, so how can we use this information? So of course, if you, if you have an upper bound on how many denominators or how many generalized propagators you can write down and each loop order, so for example, here are two loops, uh, this is great for, for a couple of reasons. So one is, is uh, you can use, this, use it to uh, reduce the, uh, the complexity of your IBP reduction, an IBP reduction in which you relate all of your uh, integrals in a topology to a small set of master integrals. And uh, again, this, this set will be dependent of how many denominators you, you define. So indeed, if you, if you have a smaller number of denominators, so for example, for this uh, two loop eight point example, uh, you only need 11, even though if you count all the momenta to be independent in D dimensions, you may think that there are 17 of them. And, and this, this, uh, this trick is also used in the, in the six, tool of six point approaches these days. Yeah, yeah. I have a comment here. This is a very nice reduction of the number of propagators from for example, 17 to 11. But also I would comment that there are some cost the cost is if you use this kind of a THV scheme, then the kinematics is not that trivial because some nonlinear constraints between all these kind of external Mendelstam variables. So uh, I think if you run standard, you, you say five or six or maybe Kira, this kind of standard uh, IBP, I would say that uh, and to tell the computer the kinematics is something quite, quite tricky. If you do it numerically, possibly no problem. But uh, if you do it analytically, this kind of analytical Mendelstam variables are not completely independent, then the program will get some trouble. That's my comment about cost. Uh, yes, so so we actually tried actually uh, already available IBP reducers, both numerically and analytically. So numerically, as you said, you don't need to perform analytic decomposition of your momentum. You just put some numbers, and uh, and the program understands it uh, very very easily. Now, if you want to do this analytically, uh, when you start decomposing uh, external momentum in, in a basis of four of them, you will uh, arrive of those gram determinants, which will be coefficients in your decomposition. But instead of keeping them analytically, the, the full structure of this gram determinant in the um, in the analytic expression, you can try to package them in some other parameters. We, we call them Z parameters. We define, we, we parameterize all of those 12 
uh, topologies in the paper using this the z coefficients so inside the z coefficients will be all the gram determinants which indeed as you said they're they're quite complicated if you want to expand them uh, but uh, you can also uh, try to um, count the the number of variables both in sij coming from from gram determinants and from this z uh, prefactors you will you will see that they that they match so so you you just need to introduce those and then again Packages which, which are already available can handle this. So, so instead of having a, a, a propagator which is like K, K1 plus K2, you'll have K1 plus parameter times K2, and they can understand it. So it's uh, it's all working working out. And so yeah, so so here we have some numerical comparison of how many how many uh, what's the what's the uh, um, reduction in time of the evaluation for for various uh, higher dots and higher ISP expressions. And also you can see that the more legs you uh, the more denominators uh, you keep or sorry generalized propagators you keep in your topology definition, you get a more um, uh, more master integrals in the in the system. Okay, now uh, on the analytic side, uh, what you can study on those uh, those uh, finite basis topologies, is, for example, their maximal cut. So um, we construct those finite basis topologies, those 12 pictures, um, play, both planar and non-planar, such that they're only made from denominators and there are no ISPs you can create. So irreducible scalar product in numerator because they were eventually linearly decomposable in terms of your, your family. So if this happens, then the maximal cut of the, of the amplitude localizes. So you, there is no additional integration that you need to perform. And this uh, this was studied, uh, for example, by Yang Zhang, how to explicitly uh, get this expression very in, a, in an easy manner. And it's expressed in terms of the Baikov polynomial. We also studied the, the, how the structure of this uh, finite basis topologies would look like at, at higher loops. And we have the expression for the leading singularity uh, at higher loops analytically uh, which, in, in, in an L uh, loop dependence. Okay, so and now what you can study is uh, you can take all of those uh, 12 top, uh, top sector topologies and study all of their subsectors on a maximal cut. Now this study is related to trying to classify all the special functions or the iterated integrals and all the geometries behind them, which will contribute to, to your two loop integrals in DIMREG. So we wrote down all the Baikov polynomials and tried to see how many uh, free variables you have and what's the degree of the polynomial. So those, uh, those will be informative for the, for the special function study. And as you can see, we, we take all of those, there is 84 subsectors which are, uh, um, um, this joint in, in, in those 12 uh, finite, uh, finite basis topologies, and we tried to map them. So was the number of uh, variables and degrees of the polynomial. So the number of variables is just the number of irreducible scalar products that you, that you have left. So for example, for the finite basis topologies, the, the, the eight point uh, pictures that I shown, you don't have any ISP. So the dot at zero, zero is exactly them. But then the, the lower topologies you go, you, um, you, in, you introduce some scalar products which are now in, the, in, your, in your basis, and then you have more and more variables and the, and the degree comes from just uh, inverting the, the, the system of scalar products in terms of denominators. You can also classify the same, the same drawing in where exactly those uh, subsectors land in terms of what's the, what's the degree of the polynomial and what is the, uh, number of variables. Okay, so how can someone use this information? So again, this will be used to classify all the special functions, the special spectrum of them, and and the geometries be behind this these special functions at the integrand level at two loops. And uh, this will be related to, uh, to all of these uh, higher genus uh, studies and then Calabia, as you will uh, see in the talk by, by Sebastian. And as I said, we, we provide a, a, a higher loop argument that at any loop order, there exists a bound again on how, uh, how many propagators you can write, which are independent. And then there is a bound of the number of uh, 
uh, those top sector topologies. And in, in each of those top sectors, you can find all the subsectors, all the master integrals in, in, uh, in those subsectors. And eventually, at some point, we'll get to a, to a notion of a finite basis at two loops. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we've tried to constrain the analytic structure. Um, now let's try to assume that we know it now in some case, and let's try to exploit it. And this will be based on my work on the uh, integrated unitarity and uh, the for loop ladder integral. So um, what happens usually in amplitude computations in QCD or standard model, is that you start with computing your master integrals. So you compute them, you know them analytically very well, and then you forget about this and you take your integrand for your full amplitude, you perform all the, all the reductions and so, such that after, for example, the IBP reduction, you express the amplitude in terms of master integrals which are not evaluated with some coefficients. And then at the very end, you combine those two so we just substitute master integrals. Then the question here is, can we use the knowledge about the analytic properties of amplitudes which stems mostly from Feynman integrals which we compute beforehand anyways, can we use this knowledge and not forget it before substituting uh, to, the, to the amplitude? Can we use it beforehand at the, in the integrand level? And the answer is yes. And uh, the way to do this has been, is based on a very, very old approach in dispersion relations. And what we are uh, trying to do here is to use this algorithmically in dimensional regularization. So it's appropriate for, for QCD and, uh, and other uh, standard model computations. And we will achieve this by exploiting the method of differential equations. So as you will see, um, by considering uh, dispersion relations, they will have something to do with cuts. So we will compute only cuts of the amplitude, cuts of master integrals. And if you put a cut of, uh, on your integral, of course, you have uh, much less subsectors of this integral, much simpler system of IBP reduction, smaller uh, differential equation, and smaller set of master integrals. And what we will also see is that this, uh, this approach uh, based on dispersion relation is uh, related to, uh, to a generalized unitarity approach in a way that not only we can constrain with cuts the coefficients of master integrals, but also we can constrain the integrals themselves. So basically by evaluating cuts of the amplitude, we constrain the full amplitude. Okay, so what I mean by this on a, some toy example, uh, so let's consider a, a one loop box contribution to an to an amplitude and uh, let's say that uh, that we take a, that uh, we take a maximal cut of this expression so we know what happens to the, to the integrand the numerator of this of the of this uh, contribution to the amplitude factorizes into the uh, three level um, contributions from the uh, from the um, from the four vertices in the diagram and on the other hand, we know that at some point it will be projected in a basis of uh, some master integral, so some box. And uh, there are two ways how you can use this information. So the standard way in the general unitarity approach would be to try to come up with all the possible numerators that you can parameterize in the in, the, in this box that you will that will eventually contribute to this to this cut in a non-vanishing way, and by doing this, you you can constrain the coefficient of your master integral of your box here to be uh, to be related to those uh, to those three level amplitudes in, in the in the corners of the diagram. Now, alternatively, what you can do and what we will exploit here, you can literally compute this cut. So you sit down somehow compute this. We will see that it's related to the. You, you can do this with differential equations, for example. And then you can try to reconstruct the full amplitude using dispersion relation. And therefore there is no leftover integral to be, uh, to be still constrained by, uh, to be still computed uh, separately like, like there is in the general unitarity approach. Okay, so what do I mean by dispersion relations? So this is, will be very, very short, uh, for a short summary. So let us focus on four point massless kinematics 
So in this kinematics, we'll define this, this variable x, which is basically proportional to minus t, and we will treat s as, a, as an overall scale factor. Um, so you can uh, try to um, write down the uh, dispersion relation in this x variable. So as I said, if it's related to the um, um, to the original Mandelstam variables, you can try to read off where the physical um, cuts, um, branch cuts will be will be present in the, in the analytic complex plane for this x variable. And uh, this will be uh, corresponding to the u uh, and t branch cut. So the, the, the one from one to infinity comes from the u. Uh, particle, multiple, multiple particle production in the u channel and from zero to minus infinity in the, in the t channel. And again, in order to exploit this analytic structure, you need to somehow know beforehand that this will be all of your uh, analytic uh, properties, so all of your branch cuts. So we need to know this beforehand. Okay, so how can we use this? We write down the contour integral, uh, like in Cauchy's integral formula, using very very old approaches by by, by Mandelstam and and, and and other authors. And we we split the con contour integral into those three pieces. The two of them come from the from the discontinuities across the branch cuts, and one of them comes from the arc at infinity. So we will try to get rid of this arc at infinity for a second, just by subtracting from our original um, original expression and evaluation of the amplitude at a fixed point z0. If you do this, you only are left with, with the two contributions from the discontinuities. And by, by unitarity, we know that the, the multiple particle production uh, discontinuity across those channels um, corresponds to cuts of the, of the, of the amplitude. OK, so we, um, yeah, so uh, so as you can see, basically what we will do, we'll compute the cut of the amplitude somehow with with the standard methods in QCD, differential equations, IBP reduction, and then we just integrate it once using dispersion relation. You will get the the full amplitude up to a, an evaluation which which is required for the uh, for the constant term. Now, if you start uh, try to uh, do explicitly what I what I said, it's not that straightforward for an actual amplitude. So you will see that this expression is convergent, that the integ dispersive integrals are convergent, for example, for canonical master integrals. But if you put an amplitude with rational coefficients, which are like rational uh, functions with some higher powers, this, this object will start diverging very quickly. So what you can do, you, you can design a subtraction term and you you just repeat the whole dispersive argument by uh, sub, uh, by multiplying your amplitude by uh, this this uh, subtraction term function, which again accounts for all of those irrational uh, divergences. Now, when you do this, when you have higher poles. Um, you actually need to also introduce the, the contribution from residues to your dispersive um, um, equation. And this may cause a little bit of trouble for the, for the amplitudes because residues are related to higher derivatives. So you need to take the derivative of your amplitude and then evaluate it at some point, uh, which is doable, but a bit cumbersome. Um, so a, a, a different approach that that we can propose here is you write down an ansatz for your for a result. Be, again, assuming you know the analytic structure of it, you put some coefficients which are unknown, and we will know how to compute discontinuities of this ansatz. So for for the all the functions that we'll consider here, these are harmonic polylogarithms, which are uh, generalized polylogarithms with uh, with letters zero and one. So we know how to compute their um, their discontinuities, and on the other hand, we'll compute the cuts of the amplitude, and we will match those two things, and we'll reconstruct the coefficients in the ansatz which were previously unknown. So you can either either do this uh, for this four point kinematics by considering the two uh, the two um, cuts in the T and U channel, and then fixing a the couple of points at, at fixed evaluation points in order to account for all the rational leftovers pieces where we take a discontinuity of this it's zero so we cannot reconstruct it directly through through this uh, through this cut 
Uh, or alternatively, uh, you can try to match it uh, through all of the available cuts in the, in the system, which uh, may not be uh, as optimal as we will see in a second, but in principle, you, by, by knowing this, all of this analytic structure, you actually can reconstruct uh, all of the terms. Okay, so a simple example, uh, let's consider uh, one loop master integrals. So we kind of know that there is three of them, but if, if we didn't, we can try to study them on a cut and on a cut, you will see that uh, one loop planar box only has two non-vanishing cuts. So in one channel is just zero master integrals, very simple expression. And in, in the two other channels, you only have two master integrals where originally you would have three, but again, we will not need this information. And those uh, cut master integrals, it doesn't matter that they're on a cut, you still can use the method of canonical differential equations, um, factorize epsilon, solve it order by order in epsilon, and just plug it into your, uh, to your result. And you can see, uh, convince, try to convince yourself that you can reconstruct the, the whole thing with those, uh, with those three approaches that I mentioned. So uh, I also uh, constructed this uh, with the with higher loop examples. So I also consider the master integrals at two loop planar and two loop non planar, as well as the free loop ladder uh, planar topology. And as you as you'll see, basically the number of uh, master integrals at the cut compared to no cut drops like twice. So it's a, it's a, it's it's definitely useful in your IBP system and dif differential equation system. Uh, I also applied it for, for amplitudes at one loop and two loop in, in QCD for, for gluon scattering. Um, so we will see that, that a lot, if you put cuts on a full amplitude, you have a lot of uh, integrals in, in principle, you cut all of them and some of them will just drop to zero. So there is uh, sometimes a reduction in, in like a uh, factor of eight uh, in the planar sector. Okay, so the application of this method um, uh, was the for loop planar ladder computation when every all the particles are massless in higher epsilon orders. Um, so the what I'm trying to um, um, stress here that all the methods which are underlying the actual computation are the standard methods that you can, so there are packages to do this, you can do this algorithmically. So for, for this problem with some packages, I found 59 uh, master integrals, but what, what we are doing here, which is new, we just put it on a cut. We use all these packages on a cut. And then at the very, very end of this simplified compute, computation, you integrate it once dispersively and we reconstruct the whole expression. Okay, and there is a mathematical form of this of this uh, integral. You can just load it and, and try to use it. Okay, so uh, how can you also apply this um, this method? You can uh, try to think about cuts in uh, in the context of kinematic limits. So if you want, uh, if you're interested in a specific log accuracy, and you can expand your um, your um, special functions, your, in this case, your harmonic poly logarithms, you can basically classify in your ansatz or in your full, full result, how the amplitude will look like in those leading clock limits, subleading clock and so on. So where the contribution will come from, it will, well, so for example, the, the suppressed term will never come from the, from the cut. So will, it's enough to just compute the cut and then you, will, you can reconstruct the, the leading log term. You can also, um, try to use a sort of recursive approach. So in the dispersion relation, you can interpret the cut as an integral over the phase space of all of the uh, all of the integrals or all of the particles uh, which the which the cut is crossing. And if if you are able to perform this integral, which may or may not be trivial, you can take the left-handed and right-handed amplitude and really there are lower loops now. You can glue them together and with this kind of recursive approach, you can start with three level and try to build up higher and higher loop uh, results. And of course, the question is, can we use this approach for more complicated kinematics than four point massless? And uh, in this multivariate case, we are studying it now with Lorenzo Tancredi and his student. And uh, as you can see, um, the more external channels I have, uh, the more cuts I can put on top of each other. 
Um, and then it's a, it's a, it's a trade-off because if you put all of those cuts, there's a lot of additional reduction in complexity of your, of your computation. But on the other hand, you need to know uh, the analytic structure and those singularities and, uh, and, and try to understand this. Um, okay, so in conclusion, we try to constrain the uh, structure of QCD amplitudes and also exploit it later on. So in terms of constraining it, we can show that at any fixed loop order, there is only a finite number of integrals that you can actually that you have to compute, which are which are distinct. This would be the, the finite basis. Uh, what we can show right now, we we explicitly enumerated the finite basis topology. So so this top sector uh, diagrams, the two loops, uh, and uh, you can proceed with the, with the study of special functions. You can also use them these you know, readily now uh, for the IBP reduction and also the numerical evaluation of, of your integrals because uh, one of the packages for the, for the numerical evaluation, the AM flow, is based on internal IBP reduction. So if you, if you try to impose it there, then you can, you can try to exploit it. And then, uh, assuming that we know an analytic structure for some for some uh, kinematics, we can try to uh, exploit it. And in this in this manner, we can try to combine the, the dispersive arguments um, and try to make it uh, algorithmic in uh, in higher orders in epsilon in, in dimensional regularization by uh, by combining it with differential equations. Uh, and with this. Uh, um, there is a, as I said, there is this trade-off. You have a lot of computational reduction in, in complexity, but again, you need to know the analytic structure beforehand. Okay, so thank you. Thanks, Piotr. Questions? Uh, yeah, thank you very much. Thanks for the nice talk. Uh, so, regarding the first part, so on slide slide sixteen and before, when you said that you were yeah oh yeah exactly uh, when you were um, scanning over different uh, over all the subtopologies and looking for the for the Bikov polynomial, looking at degree and yes. number of variable, um, did you consider or to what extent did you consider the possibility of integrating out additional variables because depending on how the bike of polynomial look like you can reduce further reduce things to much simpler things it's not necessarily uh the the yeah so uh, how, how much more or did, did you try to, to integrate out more things there or yes so uh, i would treat this picture as a preliminary upper bound because we did not use any of the bike of tricks that you can play, uh, we didn't integrate anything. So we just tried to try to show that okay, there is an upper bound. You just put I it see. there. It it may be even more simple than in this picture, as you said, if you try to integrate it out. Um, but but yeah, so we we haven't uh, done this yet. But we we are trying to investigate that. Okay, thanks. Thank you very much. Um, so uh, one obstacle that uh, may uh, make the this dispersive approach uh, uh, difficult in practice is uh, if this last integration uh, is is uh, complicated. And uh, so I was wondering. Uh, so I was playing with uh, similar ideas uh, some uh, years ago, and uh, uh, we identified certain cases where it worked very nicely. But generally, uh, the situation is that this dispersive integral can be can be hard to perform. So, it, it, what is your experience? Uh, yes. Yeah, so um, we so I definitely looked into four point massless kinematics, and then I, until all the non planars even in at free loops, there are two letters, and that's it. You need to know you can know it beforehand, and then the integration, as you said, it's it's easy or it's doable at least. 
Now, if you have more, more complicated letters, more complicated functions, we are we're trying to do this for the one mass, uh, four point with one additional mass. So we have one additional channel. And, and the letters still there are, are simple enough. So there are still HPLs. Um, but you, what you can also try to do is you can try considering higher cuts, but in, in full uh, d-dimensional approach. So you can try to compute the maximal cut and then really explicitly integrate it in d dimensions. So you need to, let's say, manipulate 2f1 functions or th things like this rather than GPLs. And maybe then it's, uh, it's, it's more, uh, it's possible to do. Uh, now, an alternative approach would be to somehow know the, the ansatz for your function and then just fit the coefficients. I guess here you don't need any integration. You just need to be able to take these continuities of the ansatz. And if you can do this, then, then I think it's doable. Okay, I see no further questions. I believe lunch is at 12.45. Okay. All right, lunch is 12.45. Let's uh... yes. thank Piotr again. Okay, thank you.